All right, guys, welcome back to the Agent Investor Podcast. I'm your host, Tom Caffarella, and we've got Shelby Osborne out of Charlotte, North Carolina. Shelby, how's everything going today? It's going so well. A little bit of camera issues, but other than that, nailing the day. <laughs> Thanks for having me. Well, that's okay. I mean, people are people are looking for information. We can we can deal with any sort of like tech issues or you know visual <laughs> issues that, that that come about. Perfect. Um, so like I mentioned to you before we jumped on, I mean, this podcast is all about telling stories about how real estate professionals got involved in real estate investing. And um, usually where I like to start is just like the beginning, which is like, how did you get into real estate to start? Totally. Okay. So I was in the military for six years prior to discovering real estate. And I was increasingly frustrated with my nine to five, except it wasn't nine to five because it's the military. It's like, you know, 5.30 to like 7.30. Um, and so I started picking my head up and realizing that if I stayed on this track, my life would look similar for the next five, 10, 15 years. And it wasn't exactly the life that I wanted to build for myself. And so I actually stumbled into real estate investing first. I found Robert Kiyosaki's book, not uh, Rich Dad, Poor Dad, actually, The Business of the 21st Century. And they have this really cool cash flow quadrant in there. I'm not sure if you've heard of it, but for the listeners, it's basically um, you're either an employee, you're self-employed, you're a business owner, or you're an investor. And like, that's the quadrant. And so I realized that I was an employee and I would be continuing to train my time for money for the rest of my life, unless I kind of switched where I was at on this quadrant and decided that I wanted to be an investor. So real estate investing just clicked with me. I decided to get out of the military to pursue it full time and was like, whoa, I need money if I'm going to invest in real estate and build this life of you know, time and financial freedom type of thing. And real estate license just made sense because it was completely nested with my goals, you know, access to deals, understanding the entire real estate process. And so I got my license in order to invest, but my real estate business has, um, since I started in 2018, 2018, I was the Keller Williams Rookie of the Year for all of North and South Carolina. So I closed 48 deals as a solo agent that year. And over the past couple of years have built the Five Pillars team at EXP Realty. And our goal is to actually help agents do exactly what this podcast is designed to do. Take, take the, open their eyes to investing and take that active income that they're building from those commissions and pour it into something that will pay them back for the rest of their lives. All right. Well, I think we're done. I mean, I think you kind of, you, you, you nailed it right there. So, I mean, there, there's so much, so much, uh, you know, to hit on and what you just said. Um, I think the first thing, you know, I got into the business, Robert Kiyosaki, same exact thing. Um, you know, I read Rich Dad, Poor Dad uh, first, then I read Cashflow Quadrant. And I, and I, I would definitely, if, if you haven't read or listened to those uh, audio books or books, I would definitely highly suggest doing so. Um, but one thing that I do want to hit on, because you, you've done a lot in the kind of short time that you've been in real estate. And to a lot of people, just selling 48 houses is like kind of out of reach. What did you do in the beginning stages? So I would say that um, having a sphere of influence was very helpful because I was in the military for six years prior. And when I decided to get out to get into real estate, I stayed at Fayetteville, North Carolina, which is the home to Fort Bragg, where if you're in the army, people come and go. And so having that sphere of influence and connection to the community was definitely a leg up in regards to starting quickly. Um, but this, that, I mean, that only gets you so far. You have to do something with any leads that come in and you have to be able to build a system to scale and leverage if you're going to be able to keep growing. So I would say that um, systems and automation were absolutely huge for me. I was in the military, like you guys know, and I was um, the HR, essentially like the head of HR for a 750 man like unit. And with that, you have standard operating procedures for everything and you have to track everything and plan so like having those ingrained into me where it's like you do something once and your mindset is I should never have to think through the same thing again because I've thought through it once, I've documented it once, and now I have it set as either a template, a checklist, a system process. Um, that from the very beginning was very helpful in scaling. Mm -hmm. Awesome. So out of the 48 deals that you did, the, major the vast majority you're saying were SOI? Yes. Um, yes. Or like referrals from them. So yeah. through, 
yeah, through my sphere of influence, or um, we did a lot of like community stuff. Like I started a meetup. Consistency mm -hmm. is key for sure for that too. And um, just by consistently bringing people together, became known as the go-to person and business was generated that way. So tell me about the meetup. Like all the meetups have to have some sort of like agenda and you're attracting a certain type of person. You know, what's your meetup all about? So it started as a place for me to find other people who were interested in real estate investing, actually. So the yeah. meetup is called Pints and Properties, and it's a real estate investors meetup that's actually now nationwide. So if any listeners want to do this exact same play in your area, hit me up and I can send you the checklist to get it started. It's free. So run with it. Um, but the, the idea was I was looking for military who wanted to use probably their VA loan to get like a house hack property and start their real estate and journey with using the resources that were available to them. So it started that way, but it also generated other investors or other agents, local professionals, and it built the network that way. That's awesome. So not only do we have a pints and properties in my, my, uh, my area, which is Boston, uh, Ooh. somebody who used to work for me is the person that, that runs it. So a guy by the name of John Bombacci, no clue if you guys have ever run into each other <laughs> or not, but, um, but he does that locally and he's, he's very successful with that. And so one thing that, you know, we always try to hit on too, is the fact that like being an agent and being an investor, they gel together. So I know, and you can, you know, talk about your experiences with this, but I know from John, you know, in my marketing, I have another agent that used to work with me in my market that did a similar thing by serving investors and really providing them with education, teaching them how to invest in real estate. They got a bunch of business. And has that been the same for you? And how has that worked out? Absolutely. So my first year, I would say um, the majority of my business was still like a normal buyer seller, but it was um, about quarter way through that first year that I started getting more and more into the bigger part, bigger pockets forums. And if you guys don't know what biggerpockets.com is, highly recommend you check it out. It is a great platform, podcast, all the things um, for investors. But yeah, so by participating more on that and entering the journey myself, I, as an investor, was able to speak the language, help other investors run numbers and kind of build a niche for working with investors, which is, if you guys are looking for business, there is a huge gap overall in the market for agents who understand the investing on a higher level to help investors all over the country. So if you want business, learn investing, you will have so much more than you know what to do with. Um, yeah. And that was like one of my, before I became an agent, and before I ever invested, I used to look for agents that understood investing. It blew me away. And this is going back to probably like 2003, 2004, after I read that first Robert Kiyosaki book, one of the things that they say in the book, they're like, find a good agent who understands investing. And I would talk to, I would go one after another, after another, after another, and they wouldn't get it at all. Totally. So, you know, one of the things, regardless of whether or not, you know, you're interested in investing but if you're trying to do a lot of business as an agent, specialization and niching down is one of those things that, that always benefits you because you're going to serve a specific population really, really well. And you're going to become kind of the go-to for that. And so you did the meetup. Mm -hmm. Is there anything else that you did along the way that kind of attracted investors to kind of want to work with you besides the meetup? Yes, I would say that going to conferences, and this was in 2019, um, where I went to as many conferences as I could, would really just change the game. So even, and I wasn't even going there to like build a client base. I was going there to personally learn, but the connections that you make at these conferences, as long as they're genuine connections, you're not like, Hey, what can you do for me? But like curious and interested asking other people what they're into. Um, those people will remember you from those and opportunities will present themselves. So based on that, you know, year of 2019, I ended up on a slew of podcasts. I was on the bigger pockets podcast. Um, and just by word of mouth and referrals based on relationships built, I would say that that's something that I can't um, emphasize enough. So you got into the business saying, hey, I want to invest. I, I don't want to be an employee anymore. I want to build a business. I want to invest all that good stuff. So you started serving your SOI, which is probably the easiest way to, to do transactions, especially in the beginning. You added the investing component, became kind of the a go-to person for people that were interested in investing in real estate. At what point along that way 
did you say, okay, great, but yeah, I got into this for investing and I'm going to take the first step to investing myself? Um, gosh, I feel, I feel like my story is so weird. I actually, I started investing, um, before I even got my license, I closed on my very first investment deal the same month that I got my real estate license. Yep. And, and that first year I did the 48 deals and agent, but I ended the year with 16 doors in my portfolio. So I did, I was pressing as much as I could equally, which I, you guys know, balance is actually not a real thing. So, mm -hmm. so it would go, you know, agent would go up and then investor would yep. go up while the other one kind of shifted, but I had both front of mind as much as it was possible. So that's something that, you know, we always talk to people about as well. And some people worry about that. They say, well, how can I be good at both? Or am I going to be negatively impacting my real estate business? Obviously adding, you know, 16 units in your first year is more than some people add, you know, in their life. So how were you able to balance that as much as you could without like taking too much off the, the gas with your real estate business? This is insanely hard. <laughs> I cannot, I, I mean, like I, I want, I want everyone to do it. Absolutely. But like the level in which I tried to reach my goals was like, it, it was very, very difficult. And I I've been told in the past that I make it seem easy, but I just want to, it is hard. So it is a decision that you have to like accept that it will, you know, well, let's, let's quantify that <laughs> because when people say work hard, everyone hears something different. Yeah. So I want to quantify, what does that mean in terms of hours per week? I woke up at four o'clock every day. Um, and even to this time, I, I probably work up, I woke up about four 35 on a late day and I worked back then all freaking day, whether it was on, and it's not just, okay. So there's a difference between being busy and being productive. It was like hyper-focused on what is the most important next step. And this is really hard to stay focused, stay like completely locked in because you're constantly distracted. There's a ping here. There's a person who needs this, all the notifications, all the noise. Yeah. Um, and, and so the mornings were incredibly important for me that four o'clock wake up and then starting what a miracle morning, which there's a book out there called miracle morning millionaires that actually changed my entire world. I do hi highly recommend it. And by starting my day off with clarity and hyper hyper focusing in on what is the most important things for me to do today it helped to expedite success um with keeping in mind that at the same time you have that stuff has to be done all of that 80 percent task because there's the 80 20 principle i'm probably going way too much now but, but maybe not um but that eight, the 80 percent stuff um finding the right people as soon as you can to execute the 80 percent while you're focused on the 20 percent is the way that the the, the movement, the traction, the momentum starts. So you're saying, you know, a lot of things that are all great. Um, my question would be, right, you started just a few brief years ago. And, and obviously, like, I've got an idea of what the answer is going to be. But there's a lot of things that you've kind of, I, you probably not mastered, but like you've picked up the concepts pretty quick, right? In just a three-year period. Like, I've been doing this for... 16 years and like, these are some of the same things that I'd be saying, but it took me 16 years. How did you condense it down? Like, how did you learn this stuff so quickly? Like, what were your keys to kind of doing that? So focusing on education as much as possible, the difference, everyone knows to read, everyone knows to listen to, to podcasts. The difference I think is that as I read the books and listened to the podcast, I took notes the entire way of like the key points that I needed to implement. And as soon as it was done, I implemented. That's the difference that I see all the time. People have content and it goes in one ear, kind of goes out the another one day, they'll do it one day, one day. But if you do it right now, if you implement what you know that you need to, then by implementing, that's another iteration in your brain. And then also rereading those notes and it just becomes ingrained in you. Yeah, it's funny. So I went to a, a real estate conference two months ago and the, the owner, the founder of Priceline, who is a billionaire today, um, was speaking. And he said, you know, one of the biggest takeaways that I can give to every single person here, he said, everybody that I ever talk to has ideas and very few actually execute. And he said, he said, it's funny because it's not a complicated thing. And he said that I've got a lot of friends that are billionaires. And I've got a lot of friends that are in the high millions. 
And then I've got average everyday friends that, you know, run a small business successfully, but aren't, you know, at the level where these other people are. And they said the only difference between the people that are billionaires and then the high, you know, hundreds of millions and the people that, you know, just achieve like moderate success is the execution piece. And he said that a lot of times people forget about that as simple as it is, is to actually take what you're learning and then putting into action. So um, that's awesome. So, so you got 16 in your first year. Are those like single families, multifamilies? What types of properties are those? Yeah. So, and it was my first year from, oh, so I started with one door that I, yeah. as a primary residence that I had when I bought back in the military. And then I got that duplex before I became an agent. I didn't tell you it was a duplex. My first intentional investment property was a duplex 25% down conventional financing, which hurt hard because the, when you're investing, uh, you're going to have all these dreams. And then you realize that 25% down on a $75,000 duplex is still a lot of money. And so yeah. then I started looking at different ways to uh, continue to move forward, especially keeping in mind that my W-2 was ending. Therefore, I was to the banks. Why am I going to give this girl a loan? I, she is, she's a commission-based, you know, that sort of thing. So I got one more before the W-2 ended. I got another primary residence. It was a quadplex though. I used my VA loan 0% down on four units. And then after that, I had no lendability in the eyes of the bank and money was, you know, work in progress. We're learning how to be an agent. And so I started looking at different ways to continue to move forward and got kicked in the teeth a lot of time when asking for private money, but eventually raised private capital to do the burst strategy on a single family, a duplex, and then a six unit. And that completes my 16 for that first little over a year. And then, okay. So that's what the end of 2018 or end of 2019? The end of 2018. Okay. And so where have you gone from there and what have those deals look like? Yeah. So after that, I started dabbling with partnerships. We did some turnkey, um, just already fully occupied, small multifamilies. The majority of my portfolio right now is um, quads, triplexes, duplexes. And then I have a, a handful of single families. I do have one five unit, one six unit, and one eight unit. But mm -hmm. um, my bread and butter now, after all of my lessons learned, I've done flip two, after all of my lessons learned is that the burn B strategy is absolutely what works best for me. And if you'd like, I'll break that down really quickly for listeners. Yep. Okay. So the burr strategy is generally where you're going to buy a distressed property that's under market value. And then you're going to rehab it. You're going to rent it. And now that it's rehabbed and it's rented, the bank will allow you to refinance to pull out the amount of money that you put in for the purchase in the rehab so you can do it again. So the burr is the buy, rehab, rent, refinance, repeat. It's a, it's a way to recycle funds. So the difference that I did in the beginning, I would do the traditional burr strategy. And by the end of it, if I did that recycle of funds, but into a short-term rental, as opposed to a long-term, it would increase my my uh, revenue. Oh my gosh. So much more than a long-term rental. And I would still be able to recycle those funds. Mm -hmm. Yeah. So, I mean, that's, that's how, you know, everybody does it. And, and when I say everybody, I mean like anybody who's built, you know, a massive portfolio has used that strategy totally. because it's the only way that you can do it because at the end of the day, I don't care how much money you start with. You can start with millions of dollars. Millions of dollars goes really quick in real estate. Totally. Right? So, so if you're just dumping 20% down, 20% down, 20% down, a lot of people incorrectly think that you need a bunch of money to start. And if you have this bunch of money to start all of a sudden, you're going to be in this perfect position. But the reality of it is, is if you're not burring, you run out of capital and yeah, you'll probably still be in a pretty good spot, but then you can't continue to grow. Um, so it's a strategy that's been used, you know, for forever by by pretty much everybody. There's nobody that I know, you know, outside of somebody who who sold a public entity or you know made hundreds of millions of dollars that just has money to put down the twenty percent, you know, forever. Um, so you've done a lot in the past, like three now going on, I guess almost four almost years. Yep. Um, crazy. But um, what would you say to somebody who has any hesitations? about investing that's a real estate agent, um, what's the biggest piece of advice you would give to them or what would you say to them? 
So a lot of people considering real estate are scared about the risk. They're like, what if this happens? Um, which is when you educate yourself and you realize that it is calculated risk, it's far less risky. But my point is I ask you to consider the alternative. So consider not investing. Consider the mm -hmm. life that you're living now as an agent where you're constantly, you close the deal, you're excited for two seconds and you're like, where's the next one? Oh gosh. And, and you're probably drowning. You're probably answering calls with your family that you're not sure that you want to answer. So the, the alternative would be living that life forever or getting over your risk and investing in something now that will pay you for the rest of your life and allow you to live the life that you want to, as opposed to the life that you're, you're shackled to. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. And that's, that goes back to the cash flow quadrant thing, right? So, you know, again, you know, I, not everybody's read the book, but you know, it made, the premise of it is as you go through the quadrants, your life gets better. And it, it starts out E as the employee and you don't have control over your time. You don't have control over your money and you get a raise of whatever somebody thinks that you're worth. And then most real estate agents say, hey, I don't want that life. I'm going to go in. I'm going to be self-employed. I'm going to work the hours I want. I'm going to get the rewards based on the effort that I put in. You get into this S quadrant, but then as much as you control your time and you control like how much money you can make, you are a slave to your clients. And if you stop, your money, money stops. stops. And what a, a lot of real estate agents, you know, are, get frustrated about is that call that they have to take late at night with their family or the weekend that they have to work and all that good stuff, which is where, you know, you start to shift into the B&I quadrant, you know, running a business that can, can run without you being involved every second and investing, which is the ultimate, which is like your money's making money. Um, and so, yeah, I love, uh, I could talk Kiyosaki definitely all day long because that's where it started um, for me as well. So, um, so yeah, so I want to thank you, obviously, you know, for coming on today, a lot of knowledge, a lot of insight. I'm definitely excited to see kind of where you end up in five years, because you've definitely made more progress than I did in my first three years. So congratulations on that. And um, yeah, and uh, if, if anybody does want to reach out to you or learn more about you, like, is there any way for them to kind of reach out in any capacity? Totally. And please reach out. Like this is totally my passion right now. I, I have built a life for, for, through investing through the agent stuff. And now like my passion is helping agents do the same. So like, that's what our team five pillars is literally based on and what we're all about. So if there's anything that I can do to help you, or if you're interested in like joining a community like that, please hit me up, uh, Instagram, real estate with Shelby or five pillars, realty.com and just contact us. And yeah, it'll be fun. <laughs> All right, Shelby, I appreciate it. And definitely guys take her up on that as a resource. One thing I've learned throughout the course of time is like people that are successful, they're obsessed with this stuff and they like talking about it. So, you know, reach <laughs> out, you know, use her as a resource and, uh, you know, definitely take action. So uh, thank you, Shelby, for, for coming on. And guys, we'll be back again next week with another awesome guest on the Agent Investor Podcast. I'll see you next week.